good man? <laughs> you guys can actually stand next to me, it's okay. <laughs> The Minnesota Constitution assigns me the responsibility to fill the upcoming vacancy in the United States Senate. I've given this important decision the most careful consideration. First and foremost, I want to appoint the person who I believe will best represent the people of Minnesota in the Senate. I selected our outstanding Lieutenant Governor, Tina Smith. I've worked with many superb public officials during my 40-year career. Tina stands first and foremost among them. She's extremely intelligent, quick to learn, yet always opening, open to hearing others' views. She genuinely likes people and people like her. She has impeccable integrity and the highest personal and professional standards. She will be a senator of whom all Minnesotans can be proud. Tina knows Minnesota. She's traveled extensively throughout our state. She knows our citizens, our challenges, and our opportunities. We worked closely together during the past seven years, and she deserves great credit for our administration's achievements, which have led to our just being named the best run state in America. Before making my decision, I listened to many Minnesotans who shared their views with me. But this final decision is mine alone. Again, it is based entirely upon my conviction that Tina Smith will be the best possible senator for the people of Minnesota. It is now my honor to introduce Minnesota's next United States Senator, Tina Smith. Good morning, and thank you very much, Governor Dayton, wherever you are. There you are. I accept this appointment, and it will be my great honor to serve Minnesota as United States Senator. Though I never anticipated this moment, I am resolved to do everything that I can to move Minnesota forward, and I will be a fierce advocate for the, in the United States Senate for economic opportunity and fairness. This is a difficult moment for us, but even now, I am filled with optimism for Minnesota, this big, welcoming, diverse, and resilient place that has been my home for over 30 years. As Lieutenant Governor, I have traveled everywhere in Minnesota. Being elected Lieutenant Governor is a little like being invited into Minnesota's living room. I've talked to people in their homes, at their jobs, in city halls, and their places of worship. We've talked about what worries them, what keeps them up at night, and what gives them hope. And I've learned a lot from that. You know, Minnesota has one of the lowest unemployment rates in the country. But I've heard stories from families who are working two full-time jobs and still struggling to find a good place to live. Minnesota has some of the best schools. But I've talked to moms who are faced with driving 60 miles every day to get their child to a good preschool. Minnesota has more people with health insurance than almost any other state. Yet I've talked to farmers who have lost access to their longtime doctors and can't afford the health insurance premiums. Minnesota iron ore built this country. Yet I've talked to rangers who are worried about the future of their small towns. And Minnesota is often named one of the best states for women. Yet even here, women still earn less than men, and women of color and Native American women have even fewer opportunities. We have so much opportunity in this state and this country, but we have so much work to do to make sure that that opportunity is broadly shared. Paul Wellstone said often, we all do better when we all do better. And I will serve Minnesota in the United States Senate, guided by these words and led by these Minnesota stories. Just over three years ago, we re-elected Senator Franken with a mandate to work hard to keep Minnesota moving forward, to improve people's lives. And with his decision to step down, it is the responsibility of our governor to appoint a person to fill this vacant spot. Now my job will be to go to Washington, D.C. to continue working on behalf of Minnesota and our country. And I will do this in my own way 
using my own best judgment and experience, but always with the people of Minnesota in mind. And it is up to Minnesotans to decide for themselves who they want to complete Senator Franken's term. They will make this decision in a special election next November. I will run in that election, and I will do my best to earn Minnesotans support. And I believe the way to do that is by being the best senator that I can be. I want to thank Senator Franken for his service. He has been a champion for our state, and I know that he and Franny will continue to work for our state and for our country. And I also want to thank Senator Franken's excellent staff, both here in Minnesota as well as in Washington, D.C., for your work to help Minnesota. You do that every day in thousands of ways. This work continues, and we still need you. I want to take a moment also to express, express my deep gratitude for the opportunity to serve with Governor Mark Dayton. I have seen how Mark brings integrity, heart, and a passion for justice to his job. He is an exceptional leader, and I am so proud to have served with him. The men and women in our office and the 34,000 people who serve in state government are some of the best, most dedicated public servants that I have ever known. I have loved this job, and I have been so proud to call you colleagues. My family is with me here today. Didn't want to stand too close, weren't, you know. <laughs> My husband, Archie, our sons, Sam and Mason, and their wives and our daughters, Emily and Julia. I'm so proud of you. I love you. And I'm so grateful for your love and support. Finally, I want to thank the people of Minnesota for this opportunity to have served you in the state capitol and for your support and encouragement as I become your senator. You know, the governor keeps a sign in his office that says, none of us is as smart as all of us. And I will take my own version of that sign with me to Washington, D.C. as a reminder of the wisdom of my fellow Minnesotans. This Senate seat has a strong abiding legacy of service and social justice that runs back to Paul Wellstone, Walter Mondale, Jean McCarthy, and Hubert Humphrey. As I take this new position in this extraordinary time that we're in, I will do my best to move this legacy, but to move it forward towards a better, more inclusive, and more just future for all of us. Thank you very much, and the governor and I would be happy to take a few questions. Governor, you said that this decision was yours and yours alone. Did you get a lot of pressure from <coughs> national Democrats on who you should choose and whether that person should just be a placeholder or run again in 18? The only person in Washington I spoke uh, with outside of our Minnesotans and our congressional delegation is uh, Senate uh, Democratic Leader Chuck Schumer. Uh, he did not express a view about who the, the selection should be. He did believe that uh, does believe that uh, the person would should run for the office next year. You know, he has a strong and legitimate stake in this decision uh, as the Democratic leader and uh, obviously wants to uh, hold the seat next year. But I didn't get pressure, uh, and the decision is mine, and Tina's decision to run for the uh, seat next year is her decision. Governor, any concerns you might be perceived as kind of installing a senator and being kind of a kingmaker here? Well, <laughs> queen, queen maker. <laughs> I, I'm doing what the Constitution of Minnesota instructs me to do. Uh, it's unequivocal that the governor appoints uh, someone to fill the vacancy until the next uh, general election, which will be in November of 2018. So, and as uh, Tina said, at that point, the people of Minnesota will decide, properly so, for the remainder of uh, the Senate term. So uh, I, I'm, do I'm doing what the Constitution of Minnesota uh, gives me the responsibility to do. Could I just, I'd like to just respond to that too. I think anybody who knows the voters of Minnesota know that they can't be told what to do. And my purpose is to go out and ask for those voters support. And that is my job to do. And um, I think that that's just such an important part of this, uh, this story that we're telling today. Well, this is an extraordinary moment, and in moments like this, 
you have to ask yourself, I had to ask myself, what was the best way for me to serve? What contribution could I make? What would that look like? I had to assess that. And as I did that assessment, it became clear to me that I'm prepared to do this, I'm qualified to do this, that I have a unique role to play here. And after I realized that, it was a very, very easy decision for me to make. Governor, how about the cascade of constitutional consequences here? You presumably will have a lieutenant governor who's a Republican if the current presiding officer of the Senate remains. Is there talk a special session? Can you talk us through that? Well, I don't have all of those answers. I, I'm not a lawyer. I'm told by my in-house legal counsel that the Constitution and the state statute are, are clear that the lieutenant, uh, that the uh, president of the Senate becomes the lieutenant governor, and that uh, she cannot hold two offices simultaneously. But I've asked the attorney general for a formal opinion. Uh, made that request in writing yesterday. Uh, expect to receive that whenever uh, shortly. Uh, because this is not my determination to make. My, my goal is to assure Minnesotans that I'm following, and we're all following, uh, what's prescribed in the Minnesota Constitution and in the statute uh, without favor to one side or another. And that will be uh, what I will carry out to do. If uh, there are those who want to uh, consider a special session or something uh, of that nature. I, I'm, I haven't really considered it at all myself. I'd have to, the same standard I have for special sessions previously, all four caucus leaders would have to agree in writing to the, the conditions and the limits. Uh, but again, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to go pursue that. And uh, I'm well prepared, uh, looking forward to working with Senator Fishbach. I called her, we exchanged uh, messages just before this event, and I'll follow up with her and invite her to lunch on Friday. I don't know if she's available then, but if not, then next week. And I'll look forward to working cooperatively with her. So you've not explored with Senator Gazelka calling a special session so a new Senate president could be elected of your party? Senator Gazelka and I have talked. He's, he's broached the subject. I said, you know, it was premature until I made this decision. I've not had any lengthy discussion with him. Uh, and again, I'm not going to pursue a special session. I'm totally fine with the, the provisions in the law and the constitution as they exist and i'll follow them as they exist unless somebody proposes to in some legal way uh, alter that uh, sequence lieutenant governor uh, when senator franken resigned he noted the irony of him leaving the office while president trump is remaining in the oval office do you think there should be an investigation of president trump or that he should, be, he should resign because of the allegations? You know, I am going to be focused completely over the next couple of weeks on getting ready to become a senator and moving into Washington, D.C. the 1st of January, and I am not going to get into a whole bunch of the discussion about what's going on in Washington right now. Um, I think that I want to say, though, that, um, that sexual harassment is a... Sexual harassment is disrespectful to people, and it can't be tolerated. And that I think it's quite interesting. I think we are in the middle of a sort of sea change in attitudes about this right now. I think in some ways this sea change is being led by young women who tell women of my generation that maybe some of the things that we put up with during our lives we shouldn't have to put up with. And that is a good thing, and it is so important that we don't slide backward, that we continue to move forward. And I can promise you that I will be working on these issues when I get to Washington, D.C., but that'll be for January. Lieutenant Governor, did you agree with Senator Franken's decision to resign? Was that his only choice? And as a follow-up, do you have any idea when he's going to leave and you can take over? Well, you know, Senator Franken, I've spoken with Senator Franken, and I know that he made the decision that he made thinking about what was best for Minnesotans. I respect the decision that he made, and uh, I think that the important thing now is to figure out a way to move forward, and that is what I'm completely focused on. Told you when oh, pardon me. Um, the, the Franken... Uh, uh, staff is working to finalize the details of this. Their number one concern is to make sure that the transition works smoothly for their staff, and we expect that it'll happen in the very early part of January. I just can't tell you exactly what date yet. 
You know, the Franken staff is widely respected on Capitol Hill and here in Washington um, across party lines. They're an outstanding staff, and I, I very much hope to continue working with them. I will go and talk with them this afternoon, and uh, I'm sure that there'll um, be lots of questions, but uh, I really hope that they can, many, most of them, or many of them, can continue to serve the state. The, no, that'll just be to their office in St. Paul. Well, over the next few weeks, this is a, this was an unanticipated moment, and uh, there are lots of issues that we have to work on in terms of transition, and that will be one of my top priorities to work on that transition. Um, so I can't tell you exactly what we'll do there, um, but that is one of the most important. That is the most important um, economic development, largest economic development project um, that has ever happened in this state, and it is an incredibly important to me, not only as lieutenant governor but also as senator, that that project proceeds well. And so that'll be the main thing on my mind over the next couple of weeks. Governor, did you give any consideration to Governor Carlson's suggestion that you hold off on this until after the, after the ethics process plays out? Did you give any consideration to that? I took my guidance from Senator Franken. Uh, he made it clear when he made his announcement that uh, his intention was to resign and uh, has affirmed that uh, in everything I've uh, seen and heard since. So I, that was uh, set on that basis that I'm have been proceeding. Do you have anything in writing from Senator Franken? I don't have anything in writing, Does no. Does that make you nervous at all? I know for the state legislature, you waited until you had resignations in writing before you... Well, I'm announcing to today my intention to appoint a lieutenant governor to the Senate vacancy, assuming that it occurs. I'm not going to speculate otherwise, but I'm not signing any documents today uh, either way. And, and again, as uh, lieutenant governor said, we'll be working on a smooth transition, but I, you know, I know uh, Senator Frank is a man of his word. I know he gave this a great deal of uh, very intense thought. And uh, again, I, I fully expect that he will uh, follow through and resign as Tina said in early January, and this will be a smooth transition and, and the people of Minnesota will be served by two United States senators on a continuing basis. I consider a number of people, uh, there are so many extremely well-qualified people in Minnesota who would be superb in, in this position. So I certainly considered uh, a number of other people, got a um, great deal of advice, both solicited and unsolicited, uh, which is understandable. And I listened to it all and considered it carefully. And Bettina is my, my selection, and I'm very uh, confident that I made the right decision. I, I, don't, I don't think it's, I don't, well, over the last five days, you know, I mean, as Lieutenant Governor said, this was not, a, not expected, and I didn't um, really, I mean, I certainly thought about it prior to uh, Senator Franken's announcement, but I didn't, uh, we didn't do any uh, due diligence or didn't bring in other people into a circle of conversation, and, and that's been part of the process for the last five days, as well as uh, when it became clear to me that Tina should be the, my appointment, uh, the considerations about uh, re her replacement and, and the factors there. So it's been a, it's been a process, and it's um, one that is now concluded, and my focus is on going back to being the best governor I can for the people of Minnesota, and Tina's uh, focus is on serving the people of Minnesota as best she can, assuming that she is, uh, officially becomes a United States Senator. How will you be different from Senator Franken? What can Minnesotans expect? Well, Senator Franken has been a real champion for this state, and he's worked on issues of importance like um, mental health for children and um, cracking down on some of the bad things that are happening in our finance um, sector in this country. And uh, I respect his work. But I will take on this role in my own way, using my own judgment and experience. And uh, uh, that's... That's what I can tell you. That, I think, is the most important thing. Lieutenant Governor, how will you respond when you run for the seat on your own to the inevitable attacks about your time as an official of Planned Parenthood? The work that I did at Planned Parenthood helped to provide health insurance, health care, um, um, helped to provide health care and treatment for sexually transmitted diseases and cancer screenings to thousands and thousands and thousands of women. I'm proud of that work. But it's not on your bio, apparently. It is on my bio. How about on your LinkedIn page? 
I don't have a LinkedIn page. <laughs> Will you let us know when you get one? <laughs> <laughs> if I do have a LinkedIn page, I didn't know. Let's just leave it at that. Well, I absolutely uh, wholeheartedly uh, support uh, Tina Smith for uh, the Democratic Senate nomination, and I hope that the people of Minnesota will elect her in November of 2018. Uh, I, I intend to be alive then. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and even a, at least a couple months thereafter. <laughs> You know, it's a valid it's a valid concern you know anything can happen to anybody uh, in this world and you know that in an ideal world uh, this would not be uh, unfolding but in the the reality of the the options the choices that were available and again my my top priority is giving Minnesota uh, who I believe would be the very best United States senator starting uh, the day that she takes its office and um, I think she'll prove that to Minnesotans, and that is the overriding consideration. So, again, I look forward to working with uh, Senator Fishbach as, if she becomes the lieutenant governor, and we'll uh, develop a cooperative re relationship, and I'll do my best to uh, stay healthy so that she gets to be lieutenant governor for the next 400 and some days. Yeah, I was I was undecided when this process began, uh, and I've got you know different points of view on both sides of that question. But when I finally th considered all the aspects of it, I was very clear that I, I wanted to appoint somebody who would run for the seat uh, next year. Can you explain why that's important to you? Well, I think it gives uh, Minnesotans again someone to uh, to size up and assess. Uh, in the real world of, of Washington politics and, and Senate service. And uh, I hope it has the, the benefit of, of uh, uniting our DFL party behind two really outstanding United States Senators, Amy Klobuchar and Tina Smith, and that that uh, is something that will benefit other candidates as well. I'm a Democrat, obviously, and I want to, uh, it's a Democratic seat right now, and I want to do whatever I can and just have it be uh, held by uh, a Democrat into 2019-2020. Can I just say, I want to just say one thing about that. Um, I think it's really important also to remember that if, um, if you have a senator, if, if I go in, when I go in and I am planning on running for re-election in 2000, running for election, pardon me, in 2018, um, I am demonstrating that I have a commitment to this job and that is so important. There is so much good that can be done for Minnesota over the next 11 months, especially if you have a senator who is committed to working to stay there. Um, and that was uppermost, uppermost in my mind as I thought about this decision. Lieutenant Governor, it could cost $10 million or more to wage this campaign in 18. Uh, are you confident you can do that? And then if you turn around again and run in 2020, it could be your full-time job, raising money. Well, the conversation about campaigns and elections, I want to um, wait for another day. But I can tell you I shouldn't be underestimated. And if I weren't confident, I wouldn't be doing this. Very good.